So all this has happened um, through one person actually, somebody who heard about the retreat centre, a beautiful retreat centre in Oxford called the Global Retreat Centre, and uh, somebody uh, contacted um, someone who's been there and told her how nice it was, and she said, can I go there for a few days because you know, I've got cancer and I would like to just reflect on things from a spiritual point of view. And her friend phoned me up and um, you know, we had to say, sorry, we don't have individuals coming you know, during the week because everybody's getting ready for the next weekend retreat. So we had to refuse that, but then thought afterwards, hey, why not do a retreat for, for people who may be living with cancer? and also their carers, or the people who support them, their family or their friends. So uh, we did do that actually uh, last October, and I know there's at least a few people here who were at that retreat. How of those who were at the retreat? You know, there's at least four or five, and um, was it good? Yes. You know, Charles, did you enjoy it? I did, very much, thank you. All right, good. So the feedback was amazing. And the brilliant thing about it was that um, it didn't just change people there and then. And we have got a photograph that you can see, which is just about to come on, um, which was taken at the end of the retreat. And as you can see, everyone's looking amazingly happy. And um, they went out feeling wonderful. And, and because it was so good and people enjoyed it so much, we thought it would be really nice to share that feeling and that experience with people who couldn't come on the retreat or wouldn't be able to be away for a whole weekend. So uh, the retreat then became the inspiration for today. And I think about 160 people have registered for today, which isn't to say they will all turn up. But so really, this is like a continuation and a step forward again into you know inspiration and hope and positivity and all the other things which we need when we're facing any challenge in our life. Actually, not just an illness, but all sorts of other challenges which most of us have to face, you know, sooner or later. So now it's my pleasure, great pleasure, to introduce Ariel Essex, who is one of our uh, key speakers today, and she's got a lovely message of hope and love, and she's, she's going to be sharing with you. I'll just tell you a little bit about her. She's a holistic healer, a specialist health and leadership coach, a trainer, author of a book called Compassionate Coaching. I just happen to have a copy of it here with me. And um, she's also uh, runs a company called Practical Miracles NLP. So full of wisdom, and she's going to share some wonderful treasures with you now. So over to you, Ariel, thank you. So a nice clap. Can you see me all right? Yes? Oh, good, good. Because I, I, I can move back and forth here and then not block the screen and I'm pretty far off. <laughs> Plus, I don't want to look down on you because I feel that we are all in the same boat here. Today, as you know, is about cancer. And I myself have had cancer three times. So I feel like I'm a self-proclaimed expert. Well, one of the reasons that I like talking is that I managed to heal and I've, on my journeys of healing, discovered a lot of things in health. And in my work as a coach, I often help people to find their own solutions. It's not working? This one's not working. Okay. Now can you hear me? Yes. Did you hear what, anything I said? <laughs> oh, good. Okay. So anyway, I had some very interesting journeys. And you know, there's a Chinese saying, it's almost a curse have an interesting life. And I used to laugh to myself, well, I was given an interesting life. And some of you may have been given an interesting life as well. I came to see this as not so much a bad thing, but as a very growthful thing. And we were talking earlier about coming from the outside in. And for me, it became very much of a spiritual journey. Healing is a, an invitation. 
it's a great opportunity to be able to look within and find the parts of us that are less than healed in order to heal them. Now we often get tangled up in the physical body, the outside parts. Today is all about looking at the inside parts. Now as a coach, people often hear my story and they say, but Ariel, how did you heal? Because my story was kind of unusual. I was diagnosed with a brain tumor uh, when I was 39 and really, really wanted to have children. And this brain tumor made me infertile. That was one of the first problems. And I thought, why did I create a challenge like that? Then I decided I didn't like the treatments that were being offered me. And because my background was in complementary medicine, I decided I would go down a different route. I would see if I could find healing without taking those treatments. The treatments that they were offering me weren't particularly effective for my kind of tumor. So, my journey began, and instead of being a miracle journey in the, in the way of we think of a spontaneous remission as, you know, you hear these stories, people healed overnight, they healed in two weeks, they healed in two months. Well, mine took nine years. And sometimes that might not sound very inspiring. And I certainly wasn't inspired during those nine years. I was quite frustrated. There were times when I, I nearly gave up and thought, am I ever going to heal? But I kept on going. Actually, what other choice is there? <laughs> You're either going to be here or not be here. So I kept on going, kept on trying. And nine years later, my tumor was clear. So during that nine years, one of the benefits was it gave me a lot of time to get very thorough about some of the things we need to look at within us in order to have healing. So people come up to me and say, well, how did you do that? How did you make the choices that, how did you make the choices of thought that allowed you to heal? And it has to do with stress. What that really means is it has to do with learning how to relax. And of course, here we are at the Brahma Kumaris, who, whose bottom line is meditation. And meditation is one of the most wonderful ways to relax and to go within. Sorry. So I looked at, first of all, what gets in the way? Why do we not go down these routes automatically? When all of us are gifted, all of us have the possibility of being able to heal ourselves. Oh, no, I didn't see that slide. Could you go back one? <laughs> yeah, that's the one. Thank you. The first thing that, that we have to combat is the fact that stress itself locks down our brain. When we're diagnosed, when we're facing the challenge of pain or treatments or all the things that come along with a healing path, it locks down the part of our brain that can actually access our higher mind and find the healing that we need. That means that the first thing we need to do is to combat the stress, to be able to even think clearly, to find the answers that we need to find. People have lack of confidence about, well, what will work? When I looked at my treatments that I was offered, what would work? And then when I looked at alternative treatments, well, there must be thousands now. Anybody here gone down that route and noticed how many alternative <coughs> treatments there are? Which one is going to be of use? Which one is going to be helpful? What if you choose the wrong one? And all of these kind of fears come up. Not knowing what to do is, is what happens after that. And then focusing on the wrong outcome. And one of the biggest mistakes people make when they are facing a, a healing challenge is the first goal they think of is, well, I want to be well. well. Of course you want to be well. I want my symptoms to clear up. I want to be back the way I was before. But of course, you can't go back. You can only go forward. Now, a better healing goal is to think about what you will do once you're already healed. Because before you were diagnosed, before you have an illness, you didn't get up in the morning thinking, my goal in life is to be healed. That's not what was on your mind. So being healed is a temporary goal. There's nothing wrong with it. It's good to be positive about it. But people get too focused on it, and that brings them to the outside part of them, to the external, and they start to fight their own body, thinking that their body is an enemy. But in fact, it's only there to help you find your answers within. 
Secondary gains or payoffs we won't have time to go into today, but lots of times there are benefits to being ill. Side benefits that maybe we hadn't noticed, and to explore those can be a way to find a way through. Sometimes people just don't apply what they know. And one of the reasons why I'm going to write a new book is I've had a lot of my own students and people who I know have trained with some of the best people around the world who have all these skills, who, who know amazing amounts of, of techniques, who meditate, who do everything right, and it's still not working for them. Well, I know how that feels because that applied to me. And for nine years I was saying, what's wrong with me? I, Perfect diet, exercise, meditation. I use NLP training, you know, all the, the information I've gotten from psychology and still I'm not healing. What am I doing wrong? So what is it that you're not applying it to? Where are the mistakes that, being, that are being made? Some people get too attached to having a specific result. Sometimes it's, you know, you really want to see the, the tumor disappear or you really want to see your blood tests come back, you know, absolutely perfect, or you really want to be totally pain-free. But sometimes that's not possible, at least not yet. A better way is to be more accepting of where you are and to go with it, flow with it. Not being able to manage your emotions is a great way to stay in stress. So to learn how to relax, to listen to your higher mind, to manage your emotions better is going to be very helpful. And finally, being distracted by all kinds of things in daily life. Simon. What I notice is that most people treat their bodies as if they're cars. And, and even in the medical world, we tend to treat the body as if it's separate from the rest of us. As if it's a machine that's just going to be fixed by some kind of treatment. And, you know, that's all there is to it. They don't look at the holistic you know, system of our miracle of a body. 70 trillion cells all agreeing to work together. How amazing is that? What they don't look at is who is driving the car and what is driving the driver. And what I mean is, what are the thoughts, the choices, the beliefs that are making a person go down a particular route? We're all looking and hoping for a magic pill. Um, and every time we chase a new technique, uh, it's kind of the magic pill in another <coughs> form. It's like, what's going to work? What's going to give us that instant result? And I'm great. I'm a great follower of this journey of chasing the magic pill. I'm always exploring new treatments, new techniques. And yet, all of them work at the right moment for the right person at the right time. There is no magic bullet. And what we really know by studying some of the placebo research is that placebos work just about as good as any magic bullet pill. Um, placebos have 30 to 75% success. So what does this tell us? It tells us that there's something else happening, that somehow the thoughts that we think have more power to activate our healing than what we do from the outside on a physical level. And this is what really grabbed my interest. This is where my focus of attention has been for the last 20 years. And again and again, I used to say, why isn't somebody studying people who've had spontaneous remissions? Because obviously they got it right. Yes? I want to ask, is magic pill and placebos have the same, are they the same thing? No. A magic pill is a, a slang term for uh, a hope for remedy, you know, a magic pill is what we call any kind of treatment we think is going to work. Whereas a placebo is not a magic pill, it's usually a pill with nothing in it at all. But it works, like magic. But magic is more than it seems to be, it's not a trick. Okay. Now, IONS, which is the Institute of Noetic Science out in California, finally did exactly the study I was praying for. They studied 1,574 people who all had spontaneous remissions from cancer. Wow, I wish I'd known about this study when I was first diagnosed. Because I didn't have any guide. I didn't have any template to follow. I didn't know that anybody was doing this kind of research then. 
Now, what they did was they looked at everything these people did, and these people had no medical treatment, and they were, they were qualified in the research study by, they were all, um, they'd all gone through the medical test to affirm that they had the condition, and after it had gone, they also had medical uh, tests to confirm that they no longer had the condition. That was one of the uh, parameters of the test. So these weren't just stories, these were medically um, observed phenomena. 1,574, that's pretty encouraging, isn't it? I mean, if so many people can have spontaneous remissions from cancer, surely it must be possible for anyone. Do you remember how many that was that? The world. <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't know how many people, I don't know how many people in total have cancer, so. It, it wasn't a study that was created to create spontaneous remissions. What they had to do was find people who had had spontaneous remissions. So they didn't create them, they just studied the ones who had. Okay? So recently somebody handed me a book about a lovely lady named Anita Borjani. I don't know if you've heard about this book. It's called Dying to Be Me. And this woman had created cancer in her body that had metastasized everywhere. She went through all the treatment. None of the treatments worked. None of the surgery worked. Nothing worked. It was getting worse and worse. Until finally, um, she was getting near death. And she made a curious decision. She thought to herself, I want to make peace with death before I leave. And this was her one and only goal. So she had given up on wanting to heal her body, so she let go of that smaller goal, and she'd gone for the biggest goal there is, to make peace with death itself. How many of us think like that? I certainly wouldn't have thought of that. Well, what happened was she went into a coma, and in her coma, the doctors didn't expect her to live, and in her coma, she left her body, and she joined with the light, and she felt total bliss. She was also, to her surprise, fully conscious, and she looked down and she saw the doctors and her husband, you know, running around frantically trying to revive her body. And she's going, oh, don't worry about me, I'm fine. I don't, I don't have any pain anymore. What are you looking so distressed about? This is a wonderful place. Well, there's nothing to be afraid of at all. I'm really enjoying this. And she wanted to stay there and she was having some, she felt so much love and peace and joy. She was totally happy. Well, the doctors managed to bring her back into her body, and they didn't expect her to live till then. But a curious thing happened. She stayed in that mental state. Four days later, all of the cancer in her body disappeared. Nobody knows why. Nobody could explain it. And she's now traveling. She's written a book about it. You can buy her book, Dying to Be Me. And what she said was the whole journey was about learning to be who she really is, going within. And of course, joining with the highest part of her. And I think that gives us a template. Now, I'm cautious about telling stories like this now because I notice that sometimes when you hear a story, story like that, which is intended to inspire and to give you hope, you can go to the opposite place. Anybody go to the opposite place and think, oh, that'll never happen for me. Now I'm making comparisons and now I feel even worse. Or you get really angry because you think, you know, why hasn't it happened for me? Just notice that. Notice that. Whatever's going on in your head, whether you're feeling inspired or hopeful that it could happen for you, or whether your mind wants to go down a negative route, because that will give you a clue on exactly what you need to relax and go into and heal in the way that Anita did, to look at what is going on inside. Now, I have discovered that these these people who all had spontaneous remissions had all done the same eight mental and emotional changes. And this is where my ears pricked up again because I was really wanting to know what do people need to do inside. That's a fairly basic list, but it's a great starting point. And I, I hope you all got a sheet of paper so you can take it home because I think it's useful. The first thing they did was they faced their crisis and owned it. It was theirs. It didn't happen from outer space. I have to confess that this is something I didn't do. I was for years and years and years saying, I didn't create this tumor. 
It's nothing to do with me. I don't want this tumor. It's come from somewhere else. I want to get rid of this tumor. It's not part of me. I don't know how it got in my head, etc., etc. So I really didn't do number one very well. So it wasn't surprising. It took me nine years. Number two, find new meaning and purpose, not only for your illness, but also for you as a person in your life. One of the things that helped me tremendously was when I looked back and did a review, I discovered that the tumor had been my best friend because it had motivated me to go all around the world seeking healing. I met wonderful people. Uh, it motivated me to spend my money doing wonderful trainings. I learned a lot. It motivated me to start sharing this work. I changed my career. It motivated me to start teaching this work. I changed my career again. It motivated me to write a book later on. And I thought, hang on a minute. My whole life has changed because of this tumor. Is that a bad thing? And then I asked myself a really interesting question. What, what, what do I feel about this now? And I thought, I really like who I've become as a result of this. And I thought, if the tumor had done all that, well, maybe it's not an enemy at all. Maybe it's a better guide for my life than I was. Because my particular um, idea for happiness, going down my route before I was diagnosed, I was going to get married and have 2.5 children, a house in the country, a dog and a cat. And you know, that was going to be my recipe for happiness. Now, there's nothing wrong with that, except everything. <laughs> it's focusing too much on a particular result. Now, I learned that one, and, and, and later when I realized I'd been given a completely different life. And that was OK. In fact, it was more rewarding. It was more interesting. It was more full of growth and development than the life that I had planned for myself. So I thought, this tumor is my friend. So if it's still here, and at that point I hadn't fully healed, if it's still here, that can only mean one thing. I'm not done yet. There's more to learn. I wonder if I get to travel some more. I wonder what my next train will be, or who the next wonderful person I get to meet might be. So finding new meaning and purpose can be a really important part of the journey. Managing and expressing your emotions is key. And you must find ways to stay peaceful, happy, and joyful, no matter what. And that's a tall order, but you can do it. And today we're going to be looking at lots of ways that will help you do just that. Work in partnership with medics. I was very fortunate in having a doctor that was an absolute jewel. He was a wonderful doctor, and when I told him I didn't want to take the treatments or the drugs that they were offering, he made a deal with me, and he said, okay, you do what you like, but I'm going to give you the prescription that you're going to carry it around. And he said, if your symptoms get worse, then you're going to fill the prescription and take the drugs. If you manage to stay on an even keel, you can continue what you're doing. Is that a deal? I said, a deal. And every, every time I went to see him, I had to renew the contract, of course, because he'd conveniently forget. But he was a wonderful doctor because he made me feel safe. And I could talk to him and we would discuss things. And I learned how to have really good rapport with a specialist. Now, not all doctors are quite so easy to talk to, but with a, a little bit of work, a little bit of kindness, a little bit of understanding where they're coming from, you can create a really good rapport with your doctor. Take control of your life. Make your own decisions. Don't do things because other people tell you to do them. Do them because they feel right for you to do them. If somebody offers you a particular plan, a medicine, a treatment, uh, even a workshop, go inside and ask yourself, does this feel right for me? Check it out with your own higher mind. Make sure that you are on board with it. My golden rule, I don't get involved in physical medicine anymore. I used to work as an osteopath and a naturopath. And now I only specialize in looking at what's within. My golden rule is that you must believe in the treatment you're taking. The more you believe that the treatment you're taking will work, the more you empower that treatment to work. 
how you think about it inside is the most important thing. Accept 100% of responsibility. Don't be like me. Don't say, I didn't do this, I didn't create this. Don't do that. Don't waste your time. Say, I wonder why I might have created this happening in my life. I wonder why I might have this incident, this challenge, this pain, or even the symptom. What could it be telling me? Take responsibility. Your body is you. It isn't a car. It isn't separate from you. It's your friend. It's telling you things every day. It's giving you instant feedback through your feelings and sensations and emotions. It's giving you instantaneous feedback. And finally, reduce stress. Laugh and love. Give your love. That sounds easy, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, I did. I, unfortunately, I was all alone. I didn't have anyone by my side supporting me, but I wasn't incapacitated. I wouldn't recommend this to somebody who was really physically ill. Um, I just had terrible pain. I had five-day headaches, and I had other side symptoms. But in fact, my tumor was quite manageable. Simon. Um, stress is misunderstood, and I won't spend a lot of time on this, but there are good forms of stress and bad forms of stress. And often when you say to people, reduce stress, you know, if, if you're somebody who's been very busy and had a, a, a really <coughs> vibrant career and you have a big family to take care of and you do a lot of things, to reduce stress seems, one, impossible, and two, possibly boring. Anybody think, you know, being stress-free would be boring? Um, at the bottom you see there's the eustress, which is the good level of stress. There's a certain amount of stress that is actually very healthy. And we have a certain amount that motivates us and drives us to do what we want to do. If we didn't have a little bit of that eustress, we wouldn't feel motivated to get up in the morning and, and go about our jobs and do the things that we do and even give our love to our family. We have a comfort zone where it feels like there's a bit of a buzz, you know? That sense of, I'm a bit excited to do this. I'm thrilled to be here talking today. There's a comfort zone where, you know, the stress is a good stress. And then, if you've been doing it too much for too long, you know you get tired. You get exhausted. And you cross that little threshold into fatigue. And then you go into total exhaustion, and then it goes into ill health. That's distress, and that's where we need to reverse this process, to stop doing the things that made us distressed and ill at ease. The stress loop is important because, as you see in the red trigger coming in, when you have a trigger that happens in your life, some challenging situation, you have a feeling. And the feeling that you have, negative or positive, is based on whether or not you get your needs met. Now, often this is totally unconscious. We don't know what our needs are, and lots of times we're not paying attention consciously to whether they're being met or not. But you can tell when you are getting your needs met. How do you know when you're getting your needs met? Anybody have an idea? Happy. You feel happy. <laughs> and when do you not get your needs met, how do you feel? Angry. Angry. Sad, miserable, absolutely. So our feelings are our friends. They are actually giving us feedback about whether our needs are getting met or not. So if you have a feeling going on, get really curious. Ask yourself, why am I feeling so happy? And what need was just met? When you're feeling less than happy, say, say to yourself, Whoa, what's going on here? What need is not getting met? Now, you either express your needs and your feelings, or you suppress them. One or the other. If you choose suppressing them, which was my favorite, where do you think they go? They don't go away. They go down into your body, and your body is forced to store them somewhere. Working as a, a physical therapist, I used to do a lot of cranial sacral work, and I'd be working very gently with people's bodies, and astonishing things happen. I don't know how many people are body workers here, but this is a very common finding that you will take a person's arm or leg or 
position their body in a particular way, and suddenly they'll have an emotional release because their body will suddenly decide to remember one of the memories that's stored in a joint, and out will come the feelings and the old experience that was originally triggered. Now, what, whether it's expressed or suppressed, it then gets to a checkpoint where somehow, on an unconscious level, you decide, did that need get met or not? If it got met, everything just subsides and you feel fine, at peace again. If the need does not get met, then it goes around into the adrenal stress response and we start to get all kinds of things, a snowball of reactions in the body. Hundreds of little chemical reactions take place. Your muscles tighten, your stomach stops digesting, your brain shuts down. A whole slew of different things happen with the adrenal stress response, the fight, flight, and freeze. Mm -hmm. Are needs always met by support from others? No. But needs can be met from lots of places. Where else could needs be met besides support from others? Oh, from oneself. From oneself. <coughs> and? From mm -hmm. others. What? Helping, Helping others. others, yeah, from giving. Mm -hmm. Where else could you get needs met? Yeah. From higher. Yes, absolutely. So you can get needs in a variety of ways, not just from others. Simon, thank you. One of the things I noticed was that people get very confused. They start out with a good idea, like it's really desirable to heal. It's a good idea. Healing sounds like such a, a proper goal to have. And you know, it's the, the fight against cancer and all the, uh, the, the battles against this and that disease. Healing is desirable, but it turns into I must fight this illness. Now if you're going to fight the illness, you're going to fight your body, aren't you? So your body becomes the enemy. And when I was um, the, the ultimate point where I had a shift in my healing, and I think it was the shift, the final shift that made all the difference, was one morning when I woke up. And as usual, I'd feel pretty much okay until I remembered, oh, I've got a brain tumor. What am I going to do today to heal this brain tumor that I would carry around like a black cloud? And this particular morning, I heard a little voice talking very quietly in my head. Have you ever noticed that little voice that's kind of chattering away in the background? It's so easy to ignore it. But I had gotten so aware of my little voice inside my head that I noticed what it was saying. And this little voice was very angry. But it was speaking quietly, even though it was angry, and it was saying, I'm so sick of this. I don't want to deal with this tumor anymore. I want to get rid of this tumor. It was so angry. And I realized, listening to the anger behind this little voice, that if it had a gun, it would shoot the tumor dead. It, it was murderous. It's anger, it's rage against having this problem after so many years it was intense. So I was fighting my own body. Now if you're fighting your own body, does that sound loving? How do you think your body's gonna react if you fight it? You know, if it, if it had been my leg and I chopped it off, I mean, how would your body react? It's not gonna be very happy. So I thought to myself, what can I do that's different? And the obvious thing is the opposite would work. But that's a problem. Because what's the opposite of fighting an illness, fighting your own body, wanting to get rid of the thing? What's the opposite of getting rid of something? Embrace it, embrace it and accept it. Did I want to embrace and accept my tumor? Uh-uh. <laughs> uh-uh. I thought, I got a problem. Because I can't pretend. I mean, my body will know. <laughs> I can't kid myself that I'm accepting what I consider to be totally unacceptable, what I've spent years trying to get rid of. I can't kid myself about this. So what can I do? And it was at that point I did a review of my whole life and saw what a friend it had been. And it was at that point I started to realize that if it was still here, that could only mean my process wasn't complete and I could just continue. And I could trust it. 
Because so far, I had made progress. My tumor had stabilized. I had not yet had to take any medicine or surgery. So I was safe. And I thought, well, I could be here like this for a lot longer. It's taken me nine years so far. Might be here forever. What would that be like? And I decided that's okay too. Because I had grown so much, I was so much more able to accept it, that I decided that was okay. Then I gave it permission to stay, and I really meant it. And I had a silent conversation that went along the lines of, of I give you permission to stay to the end of my days, because I now trust that you're here for some purpose, whether or not I know exactly what that purpose is. I secretly thought it was just trying to keep me humble, because what would I have been like if I'd healed it in two weeks? <laughs> we have another one. Being my best, I must be perfect. We slide into a negative way of looking at that. Being your best is wonderful. I must be perfect. You already are perfect. But when we must be perfect, we put a lot of stress on ourselves. I must work hard becomes I must succeed. Different pressure, isn't it? Being responsible. This is the one where most people really get caught up. It must be all my fault. I'm to blame. I'm guilty. No, it's nothing to do with guilt and blame. Being responsible is being responsive. It is learning to listen to your body. It's learning to take, take charge again and to be in control of your own thoughts and emotions. Connecting. We need and want to connect with love, with everyone in our life, with ourselves, with God. What that turns into is I need everybody's attention. I need people to take care of me. I need people to fulfill my needs. I need people to do what I want them to do. I need people to take me here, do this, do that, give me treatments, help me, save me. Yeah? It's very easy to slip into that. Love and support, kind of similar. And making things nice, that was when I caught not long ago. You know how we want to make things nice, make things look nice, make things you know, sort of seem nice where we are, have everything just so. I'm a bit OCD myself, I, I confess. I must stay in control is where it slides into. If you can't let go of that tendency a little bit, then it becomes too much. And this is all about accepting. So, so I have a three-step path, which is very simple. First, you need to set a great goal, and I'm sure that we're gonna be working on things along that lines all day today, to choose a proactive path, to say yes, that what is, to start from that place of accepting where you are. When you start from the place of accepting where you are, it's much easier to choose a goal that is going to be right for you. Then, work on choosing peace in every moment. Sometimes this may be helpful to have a therapist work with you through some of the underlying problems, dynamics. If you're feeling less than happy, if you've got negative emotions and you can't figure out where they're coming from, find a friend to work with. Find a way to choose that inner peace and reframe and resolve whatever's negative and holding you back. And then practice. Practice is about choosing the positive thoughts, words, and actions with patience and persistence. That's every day making the choices for peace and love and to being the best you can be. I'm a, a great follower of a book called A Course in Miracles, and this is just one of my favorite quotes. It says, every miracle begins with a change of thought, a choice of how you want to be. Thank you. Problems are like icebergs. We're usually only aware of the very tippy top of what's going on and all the rest is in the unconscious. Now our bodies are the embodiment of our unconscious. So when our bodies are expressing something, it's a clue about what's in the part of our mind that we don't usually go to. It's a real gift to observe your body, to tune into your body's energies 
and to be able to have the kind of energies that heal. I have a very complicated um, version of this, which, go ahead, I won't have time to go in today in great depth, but I just wanted to leave you with the idea that way up at the top, that's where we live, where it says body and our needs and our symptoms and our goals, and then we go into denial and resistance about the fact that we created what we created in our life. That's where we live most of the time in our conscious mind, all above the water in the iceberg. But underneath the water are all the other things that are going on in our being, all the emotions that are floating around, which we only sometimes become aware of when they bubble up, but they're brewing down there all the time. And those emotions come from the needs and the beliefs and the values and the decisions and the conflicts, and they create lots of deeper levels of emotions. And then deeper down, we have lots of other things in the iceberg. But notice what's at the very bottom, at the very core of you. That is you. That's your true self. All the other stuff in the iceberg, that's not really so important. And notice that there's a pink line that says choice. At every moment, every moment, you have choice to remember who you really are, the being of unconditional love, Truth, innocence, happiness, bliss, and peace. We have to remember that we have tons of thoughts going around our mind. 60,000 thoughts a day. That's a lot of thoughts. Do you think you're conscious of all 60,000? Uh-uh. Now, the, here's the bad news. They were the same 60,000 thoughts you thought yesterday and the day before that and the day, day before that. We are such creatures of habits. And these thoughts that keep pinging around our brain like, like a pinball machine, they are all incorporating lots of the things that have never been resolved, at least not yet. And these thoughts build walls in our brain. And one of the things that ions discovered was that these thoughts actually impede nervous pathways. They stop the good thoughts from getting through sometimes. This is... Um, some of the thoughts that I captured from a client who came in who was having panic attacks. And as you look at these different things, you might start to notice some familiar statements. I mean, how many of you can resonate with some of these things? He told me a story about where his panic attacks came from, and these were some of the ideas that were pinging around his brain. And look at it's a loop, it's a never-ending loop. Once it gets triggered, it goes round and round and round. Now, how do you get out of something like that? Well, first, stand back from it. Doesn't it look like a work of art? <laughs> I mean, your brain created this. I mean, you, we've all got one of these going. We have different things in the, in the boxes, but what a work of art. You have to admire the creativity. <laughs> stand back from it, because if you can sort of distance yourself from that part of your mind, that's a good first step. That none of that is truly you. It's not what's at the bottom of your iceberg. It's not what's in your heart. This is all the pingy stuff in your thoughts. Um, skip the next one, Simon. It's just another one. Um, every situation properly perceived becomes an opportunity to heal. And I think that's where I'd like to finish today, just by saying, the rest of today will be opportunities for you to discover all kinds of ways to meet those eight criteria on the list that I hope you got from the IONS research and to be able to start feeling more at peace and making those choices that really heal. That's the way that you can have the kind of energy that really matters for healing. Questions? Any questions? Thank you. So you, um, I'll just read um, Jan's bio. Hypnotherapist, performance coach, writer, facilitator in health and social care programs, and author of the acclaimed Lifting Your Spirits book. Jan will tell you more about that. Um, 
throughout her time, and then another thought. Um, so let's just say, so lifting your spirits is seven tools for coping with illness. The lovely butterfly, have it there, transformation. And the heart of well-being, seven tools for surviving and thriving. So I know Jan's got some wonderful insights, lots of wonderful information for us. So um, I'll hand you over to, to Jan. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. You are allowed to clap. Yes. <laughs> really nice to be with you today. I feel very privileged to be in your company. Um, I'm going to tell you a story with some words and pictures about my own discovery of seven tools for coping with the challenges of illness. Um, actually, I'd already, uh, I was already using these tools um, in a totally different way before my shock diagnosis of cancer um, a few years ago. And uh, the tools um, that I'm going to be talking about, I would call them spiritual tools because they take you to that place inside where you discover the authentic you. And when you do that, it is essentially healing. And I was using these tools in a, in a rather logical and rational kind of way on a program that I was party to developing called Values in Healthcare, a Spiritual Approach. And we were um, introducing healthcare practitioners um, in the UK and in other countries to some tools to help address their stress and burnout. And sometimes the fact that they had lost that connection with what was really important, what had taken them into the healthcare profession in the first place. And um, so the tools were rather different teaching tools and um, not, uh, you know, the usual talk and chalk kind of way of learning, but a way of learning that was uh, about a deep personal reflection and a deep personal journey. And um, I've just got to the point where um, I've been very much involved in writing up this programme. It was very innovative, very new. And um, we have published it as a pack with the Janky Foundation, who some of you might know about. Um, we were going to roll it out into um, various countries around the world, so it was very exciting for me. I was lined up to go to New York and to India uh, to train facilitators in using the program. And um, I then <coughs> had this very shock diagnosis, having had a misdiagnosis several times. Um, of having a large inoperable tumour and um, as my oncologist um, told me, um, a very difficult uh, treatment ahead which um, involved both chemotherapy and radiotherapy but in a rather difficult <coughs> place in the body. Um, so uh, strangely this kind of took me uh, as uh, in Ariel's um, uh, own experience and into a whole another kind of way of being, a way of life, a change of career, and uh, a, a, lot, a lot of uh, amazing discoveries. So I'm going to share this with you as a story with some of my own photographs and some of my own reflections. Uh, before I do that, I'd like to just very quickly uh, reflect on the nature of illness. Um, could I have the next slide, please? Sorry, <laughs> Thank you. Um, with illness comes big change, and uh, the shock of a diagnosis, and I'm sure some of you will have experienced this, causes a major disturbance in our whole well being physical, certainly, but also mental, emotional, and uh, spiritual. Um, we feel sometimes a loss of all the things that we felt <coughs> defined who we were, a loss of our roles, um, what's familiar to us, what defines us. And with that comes a feeling of separation. <coughs> Somehow the rest of the world's going on quite you know, normally out there and suddenly we've been cast into this role of cancer patient. 
and um, it all feels rather strange. Um, and with that, with that strangeness and that fear and that sense that we're now in danger, comes uh, feelings of anxiety and stress. Um, we also enter into a world of waiting. You know, we wait for, we wait to see the consultant, we wait for test results, we wait maybe for surgery or treatment, we wait for outcomes and results. So it's a kind of world of waiting and it's quite difficult to um, <coughs> become this patient, patient if you like. Um, and I reflected a lot about the quality of patients, um, but more of that later. Um, there's a roller coaster of emotions and negative thoughts that come with that. You know, we can deny or resist what's happening and that can let, lead us to a sense of disappointment or even resentment. We can feel like giving up or we can feel angry, want to blame something or somebody, our bodies, other people. Um, we can set up that state of battle that Ariel explained is so unhelpful to our bodies because when we're in battle mode, we're squirting out even more stress hormones. We're setting up a war against ourselves. And a lot of battle talk is used in healthcare. You know, we talk about, don't we, fighting and battling cancer or depression or whatever. Um, we're also prey to the negative thoughts and, sorry, yeah, could, could, do ask the question now, but it might be nice to have some questions at the end as well. Yeah. Uh, when, when you touch upon uh, mental illness, uh, is uh, mental illness uh, as a result of physical illness? Well, they're very connected, aren't they? I mean, the, the, the body-mind uh, connection is very strong. So the one can cause disturbance in the other, and it can happen either way. So if we have mental stress or anxiety, that can affect us physically. If we have physical stress and illness, that can affect us mentally and emotionally and spiritually. So there's a kind of there's several connected dimensions to well-being. Um, so we're also prey to the negative thoughts and feelings of other people, and people can unwittingly say some pretty unhelpful things at times. Um, also we're very aware of the effects that our illness has on others, particularly close family. I think one of the most difficult things I've ever had to do is tell my children that I have cancer, particularly when they know that my mother died of cancer very young. So it's, it, you know, we're, we're we're having to almost take on board those feelings of other people around us and close to us just at a time when we don't really have the resources to deal with that. Um, so all of these things can lead us to physical suffering, to mental stress, to emotional upset and to uh, a spiritual disconnection because we don't know who we are. <coughs> Have the next slide, please. Um, I do a lot of work now in hypnotherapy with clients using a technique called reframing, which is literally getting somebody to relax, to step back, and to see something in a different way. And we can reframe how we perceive illness. And um, this is how I reframed when I had begun to calm down a little bit reframed the, uh, uh, the experience of illness. Illness brings a lot of opportunities. It's an opportunity to reflect on life and reprioritize. So one of the first things I did was to create a new kind of day for me. Um, I actually set aside a lot of duties, a lot of have, have to's and shoulds and uh, those kinds of obligations that weigh heavily. And I unpick my day and I put it together again in a new way. And I all even wrote a kind of timetable for my day, but using pictures of kind of light-hearted timetable, which took me into doing some of these things, to enjoy being out in natural surroundings, even though I couldn't walk for very long, just a few minutes. Uh, 
ambling through a wood or in surrounded by green or just looking at something very beautiful like a bunch of flowers um, is very healing for the mind and body. Um, illness is an opportunity to develop more meaningful relationships with those around you and having the time to do that. And I think one of the best things that I did uh, unwittingly was to um, invite people to take me to my radiotherapy, which I had to go to every day for six weeks. And um, everybody was so pleased to do it because it gave them something practical that they could help me with. And every day the doorbell rang and there would be a different person. And sometimes somebody in a suit on their way to work or sometimes a friend in casual attire or my dad would come and sometimes. And it was a wonderful opportunity just to catch up with people that often I didn't have time to do in my past existence. And we would chat on the way to the hospital and we'd be nattering away in the waiting room and I often wouldn't hear my name being called. And it was a real blessing to uh, have that sense of connection. And sometimes we would do some very therapeutic things afterwards, like going shopping or having a coffee. Um, illness could also free us up with time to develop or to uh, revisit creative pursuits or hobbies that we've set aside in our busy lives and uh, I'll come on to creativity and what I chose to do um, with some of my time. It can deepen spiritual awareness and this is a thread that runs all the way through what I'm going to be talking about. Um, it can also on a practical level um, get us thinking about preparation for the future um, and putting our affairs in order. Um, I think the most surprising thing about um, surrendering to uh, the opportunities of illness is that for me it began to bring me unexpected moments of pure happiness, uh, of joy, of feelings of fulfilment. A worried friend would come to see me and then would go away feeling so much better. Um, so, and that comes from really a growing ability to live in the moment, to be okay with what is and how it is right now. Uh, and illness, you know, we talk about illness as being something that interrupts our lives and that how it will be when illness finishes. But actually illness is just part of life, it's part of the flow. Um, wherever we are in that flow, um, these tools um, that I'm going to describe help us to be okay with where we are right now. Thank you. So these are the um, seven self-help tools that I have been teaching, but not necessarily using very much in my life. And I gave my life over to practicing these in a kind of almost unintentional and intuitive way. Um, when my oncologist was talking about my treatment, one of my questions I asked was, is there anything I can do to help myself? Uh, and his answer was, no. Um, I decided there were loads of things that I could do. And um, this really is about um, what I decided to do. All of these tools help us to find that inner self, to find that place of inner stability, of inner sustenance that we can draw on, whether we're coping with difficult treatment, our own emotions, the emotions of others, the uncertainties, whatever it is. Um, and uh, it's a gentle way of coping with illness. It takes us away from that kind of sense of battling. The benefits are many, and uh, I'm not going to read out the list, but um, using any of these tools, even for a couple of moments a day, may help to reduce pain, to reduce anxiety, to develop that sense of inner peace, to be able to step back. Another, another technique I use with a lot of clients is this technique of getting into the witness position, an observer position where through relaxation or meditation we can just step back from our own situation. We can see the big picture 
we can see the wood for the trees, you know, all those metaphors we use. And in doing so, we can then act more resourcefully. Our brain is fully engaged. We can see the possibilities. And that's so helpful when we have to make important decisions about our treatment and about how we're going to go through this. Um, we have talked about increased fulfillment in, in relationships with others, that sense of connection, that being okay with whatever is happening. And also an opportunity for self-knowledge and self-learning, because I think illness presents us with one of the most valuable opportunities to learn about who we really are. Certainly spiritual connection too, of, of finding something that's almost bigger than ourselves that we can connect to, whether it's nature, the divine, universal energy, something that we can draw on, that helps us also to go inside on that inner journey and connect with that, that essence of us. Okay, thanks. So um, now more just pictures and words to take you briefly through the seven tools. Uh, the first one is meditation, and it's discovering that power of peace. When I find my inner peace, I can handle anything. A meditation, even for a two or three minutes, can help just to calm everything, to still things. Um, it can have quite an effect on pain as well, because it's almost as if we accept and watch the pain, and in doing that, that can just kind of settle that underlying fear. Meditation, often people think, is uh, a, a skill that involves stilling the mind. But actually, all we need to do is to focus the mind on peaceful thoughts or peaceful images. Um, and that will bring that sense of, of peacefulness. Um, we don't have to sit still. In fact, I found it very difficult to sit at all uh, because of uh, my tumour and the pain that I was in. So I, would, I created a walking, a little walking meditation that I would do, where I actually thought of my connection with the earth and the peacefulness of, uh, that I could send into the earth and the earth could send into me. Um, so we can create movement in our meditation as well. And um, when I was resting uh, through my treatment, I was very lucky to be in a room at the back of my house that faces west, and it was the autumn when I started my treatment. And this is actually a sunset in Brighton. <laughs> um, it looks quite tropical, but we have the most amazing sunsets that autumn. Just focusing on that sunset um, was a, a meditation in itself. And, um, Here's a little reflection that, uh, of, of that time and using that tool. Following my diagnosis, I found it difficult to sit in silence. My mind teemed with anxious thoughts. I was continually drawn to what was going on in my body, in particular to the pain experienced by a fast-growing tumour. However, there were fleeting moments in which I could just observe the pain as if I were detached from the physical body. It was in these moments that I began to experience a brief sense of peace. So that's just a little beginning, and I know there'll be more about meditation as we go through today. The next tool is a wonderfully powerful tool, and I use this a lot in my hypnotherapy, and I use it a lot in my own life. And it's picturing good health, or picturing how we would like things to be. Picturing doesn't mean having to visualise and see inside. We've all got the dominant sense, and for some people it's quite difficult to see pictures in their minds. But it's about engaging as many senses as we can to create a, a rich vision of how we would like things to be. Um, sight using our, our um, hearing, um, conjuring up sound, um, or sights, or smells, or textures, or feelings. And it can be about visualising how we're going to go into a difficult situation, maybe, and having all the supports around us that we need. 
or it can be visualizing what it would be like to be in perfect health. And we can use it for so many different purposes. It's deeply relaxing to visualize and it can really boost uh, immunity, it can boost our resilience. Um, we, there have been some very interesting research studies that shows uh, the power of using visualization on immunity, on both the uh, increase in the number of uh, uh, immune cells and also the decrease in the number of unhealthy cells in the body. We've only got to think about a lemon to find ourselves producing saliva. Well, how did that happen? You know, there's no lemon there. Um, it just shows the power of the, body, of the mind uh, and how it can create physical uh, effects immediately within the body. So we can harness this for good. <coughs> I have the next one. Yeah. Um, this is a picture of the bluebell wood uh, that I walk in every spring. In fact, I was there last Sunday. And uh, I love the bluebell wood. It is so multi-sensory because there's the blue, the sea of blue, there's the smell of those bluebells when the sun warms them up a little bit. There's the sound of birds and trees and a little rustling breeze. There's so many um, sensual delights in a bluebell wood. And this is where I decided to go in my head for all my treatment and for any difficult situation that I found myself in. Um, I have a very dear friend who's a cardiologist in the States, and he is also trained in clinical hypnosis. And I was very lucky that uh, he happened to be visiting when I had my diagnosis. And we sat down and created a visualization in a blue band where I could go for my treatment. And it subsequently became a track on the CD in my Lifting Your Spirits book. Um, and here's a reflection uh, from that. Many people, including healthcare practitioners, used negative words to describe my cancer treatments and possible side effects. For example, toxic and burning. I decided to visualize the treatments as being gentle and healing. In my bluebell wood, I sensed each beam of radiotherapy as a shaft of sunshine, penetrating my body in a kindly way. I felt my skin as cool and intact, without inflammation. I saw the chemotherapy as a beautiful golden liquid, supporting my body to heal itself, and dissolving cells which were not helpful to my well-being. I imagine my vein opening in acceptance to it without difficulty or irritation. I practice seeing myself undergoing my treatments in that bluebell wood in a calm and light-hearted way with all the supports I needed around me. Now it so happens that I had the opportunity to um, re-practice this a little bit last week. I had to go for a, nothing to do with cancer. I had to go for a nuclear medicine scan. And I went into the room and it was really, really cold. And I had to take off um, my, the top half of my clothing and I knew I would be sitting for, uh, sorry, lying absolutely still for 20 minutes. And I had to lie in a position that I find very uncomfortable, which is with my arms above my head. Uh, supported, but nevertheless with my shoulders rather difficult. Um, and I thought, bluebell wood? Come on, let's get into the bluebell wood. So I was lying there in the bluebell wood, and there was a particular light in the room that I transformed into my mind, in my mind, into sunshine. And I made a um, kind of surrender type, you know, when you're on the beach and you put your arms above your head, and that's where I was, but lying in this bluebell wood, full on sunshine. And uh, 20 minutes just passed like that, and I realized that my body had stayed really warm, despite the fact that the air conditioning was very strong to keep the machine cool. Um, so I walked out thinking, yeah, this really works. <laughs> I remember this. Um, and I must say that visualization helped to minimize a lot of the side effects that I was told I would have. 
And my oncologist, every time he saw me, he looked for those signs and they weren't there. We always have a chance about that. Okay, so next slide. Creativity then, giving voice to our unique creativity, because we all have a unique creativity, is healing on all levels. And we've seen um, over the last years a lot of introduction of art therapy into both physical health services and mental health services, because it is essentially therapeutic. It enables us to express who we really are. And it's not the outcome. It's the process that takes us away from that busy, chattering, often negative mind into a still and fully absorbed place. And it, I'm sure some of you will know that feeling if you uh, paint or garden or cook, that sometimes you lose a sense of time. You are so absorbed in the process. And it doesn't have to be art. We can do anything creatively. We can arrange food creatively on a plate, hair on our head, words on a page. Anything can be done in a creative way. Next slide. Um, I decided to have a go at sculpture when I was going through chemotherapy. It's something I always fancied doing. Um, there's the model in the middle of the room, and my head is to the left. I've got my head to the head I was sculpting. My first ever sculpture. And um, I was in quite a lot of discomfort at the time. And it, it was a magical process because it had always happened that I would start off, as I'm going to reflect here, feeling very uncomfortable. But here we go, here's a reflection. Once involved in the creative process, it is such a relief to stop thinking about my illness, my discomfort, my treatment, the outcomes, and so on. I start the sculpture class feeling exhausted and uncomfortable. As I work the clay beneath my fingers, I think of nothing. I enter an empty space full of potential, where time ceases to exist. Out of this still space, I can create something of my true self. I've never done sculpture before, and yet the face and head which emerges is almost alive in its realness, full of understanding and compassion. As I work, I stroke the contours I create. I hold the face gently in my hand and I come into my original self, a holy, creative being. So creativity, another very powerful tool. We know that anger and jealousy and resentment can feed illness. And it's all to think about cultivating a sense of appreciation uh, when you're ill. But showing appreciation on a regular basis can help us feel better physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. <coughs> we can appreciate things on many levels. We can appreciate ourselves and our body's efforts to heal and to create balance. We can appreciate others. We can thank others. It's so easy to criticise, particularly when we're not feeling good. We can appreciate our surroundings. We can, as I've mentioned, spend time in nature and appreciate the beauty of things. Particularly, I found, now I have time, I could actually appreciate these things. Appreciation becomes a stepping stone to deep gratitude. And deep gratitude is a spiritual practice. As my treatment rolled around into spring, I had some wonderful tulips in the garden. And I just happened to notice, because I was noticing things for the first time, that as the sun warmed them, they just opened and opened as if they were so appreciative of that warmth and that sunshine. Um, and I put a little thing at the top here. When I appreciate myself and others, it creates an atmosphere of mutual respect and good feelings. 
I even show deep gratitude towards all my medication. Now this probably is one of the most important lessons I learned. And I learned it from my cardiologist friend who encouraged me to be deeply grateful that these treatments exist. Like Ariel, I have used a lot of complementary <coughs> therapies and I knew they could be very helpful. Um, unfortunately, I was really up against it and I was facing a lot of conventional medicine and I knew I could use those complementary therapies to support me through uh, that medical um, intervention. But again, I have a big reframe about conventional medicine. Um, sometimes, you know, um, if something needs fixing, uh, going to see, a, a, you know, having your feet massaged might not do it. And my cardiologist friend um, encouraged me to have this gratitude towards the treatment. It changed everything. I think my body just opened so in such <coughs> acceptance towards it. And I felt that that also helped to not only minimize my anxiety, but minimize the side effects. So um, here's a little um, reflection. I remember to show appreciation to myself. As I wake each morning, I smile into each and every part of my body, each organ, my bones and muscles, my blood, and every healthy cell in my body thanking them for coping with the treatments and helping me to heal. I thank myself for staying calm in a difficult situation, for carrying out a simple task, or for managing to go for a walk. After a particularly difficult examination, I gave some specific thanks to the nurse by saying, thank you for holding my hand in such a caring way during the examination. It really helped me to stay calm. Remembering to show appreciation gives me some control over what is happening to me. It encourages me to think positively in the most difficult situations. I then tend to act positively, and my actions affect others around me in positive ways. It's like a virtuous circle. Thank you. So, moving on to play and laughter. <coughs> Illness, of course, is a serious business, and people around us can feel that they need to be quite solemn and serious too. We often think of play as adults as something a little bit childish, but play can take us out of the roles that we find ourselves uh, in in much of our lives. Play can develop our sense of connection with other people. And there's many benefits of playing and being light-hearted. It's very relaxing and it reduces stress, it diffuses negative emotions, and it puts things in perspective. So a little saying here, a sense of humour makes difficult things easy and heavy things light. Play reduces stress and enables self-learning. So here's a little reflection. Um, sorry, these are my children. <laughs> um, having a real sense of connection through laughter together. I always love this phone, so it makes me feel really good. Um, and this is a reflection about <laughs> one of them. I hung out some bed sheets in the sunshine and was in deep thought. Suddenly a large shape loomed at me through the washing and gave me a big fright. The laughing face of my daughter appeared through a gap in the sheets. In that instant, I knew I had two choices. I could cover up my unnecessary fear and embarrassment by being angry with her and critical of her silly, childish behavior. After all, she, I think she was about 20 at the time. Or I could laugh at my reactions and join her in her playfulness. I quickly started laughing. We laughed and laughed together, and then we hugged for a long time. I knew I had created a healing moment of connection. So there's always a choice. 
I wanted particularly to raise the benefits of laughter and finding opportunities, whether it's borrowing funny films from friends or asking them to email uh, jokes, whatever it is, just finding opportunities for laughter because it releases endorphins through the body, the, the feel-good hormones, it boosts the immune system, lowers the blood pressure, exercises the heart and diaphragm, it can improve sleep, it can enhance mental function, it can increase pain tolerance. Children laugh 400 times a day on average. Adults laugh only 14 times. So it's a good opportunity to bring a bit of laughter into our lives. So, yeah, <laughs> that's not, it's good. <laughs> okay, so on to the next one. Listening, deepening, deepening our connection with others. Healthcare is fraught with difficulties in listening. You know, we're often anxious patients, uh, things that the consultant says goes in one ear and out the other. Um, Time-limited professionals working in cramped and non-private places uh, often find it difficult to listen to. So practicing what I'd like to call deep, open-hearted listening, even for a few moments, this doesn't need a long time, can provide a sense of real connection between two people. And it's beneficial for both parties. What can we do as patients? We can model what it, how we would like to be listened to, in the way that we listen to others. When we want to make changes in others, we can only ever change ourselves. And in making the change in ourselves, uh, we can then um, set up an atmosphere in which others can change. It requires that we're calm, that we find our inner peace. I think I might have... Uh, Let's go on to the next slide, and uh, I think there may be a slide beyond that. Yeah, um, I'll go back, uh, go back to the picture for now, and then I'll... Is that the next? Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Um, so this is a picture, my husband's in the uh, middle of the picture here, and you can see what a good listener he is. He is a wonderful listener by his body language, how open he seems to listening to my friend. Uh, talking at the right hand corner there and um, here's a little uh, reflection I experiment with deep listening when I'm with my consultant it seems to remove some of the barriers between patient and doctor it is as if I'm setting in, in an example of how I wish to be treated and this is then responded to I'm able to tell my own story in my own way and to have this listened to and understood. This feels good for me, and I think for him too. So, the next slide. And this is really some, just some principles that you can maybe practice. Um, there's a whole track on the Lifting Your Spirits disc about um, getting into this mode. So, adopting that easy, open posture, breathing in a calm and regular way and bringing peaceful thoughts to the mind. Imagining your heart opening towards the other person. Being fully attentive of what they're saying. You know we're often thinking about our own agendas when we think we're, we're listening to somebody else. Um, being fully attentive. Feeling respect for the other person's story. And trying to stay quiet, you know, rather than interjecting and making lots of grunts and noises during uh, somebody else's story. It's quite an interesting thing to practice, actually, being fully quiet and fully open. It feels quite strange, but it, uh, it, it really does change that connection uh, with the other person. Thank you. Okay, so coming on to the last one um, is reflection. Making time for meeting ourselves. Illness can make us dwell on the past, on how things used to be, and that can set up a sense of loss, of sadness. Using the tool of reflection uh, 
particularly with illness, because it does provide us with an opportunity to take a fresh look at what's important, what gives meaning in our lives. We can make sense of illness as just part of life's journey, and we can focus very importantly on how far we've come, not how far we have to go, with a sense of achievement and pride looking back at our lives. It's a time also to let go, and reflection can help us to do this, to forgive ourselves and others for past mistakes, for things that went wrong. It's all in the past, um, to be fully here in the moment. And we can come through reflection to a place of acceptance, preparing for the future, whatever that might be, um, <coughs> And uh, we can, there are various ways we can reflect, just sitting quietly. Some people decide to keep a journal to actually write through their illness. I found, although I was a writer, um, I couldn't write a word through my illness or treatment. So actually, this is my reflection through um, my radiotherapy. Uh, I, they're actually water lilies. And, um, I have six weeks of every day, and every day I come with a little petal uh, of a water lily because water lilies are cooling and the water's cooling. And um, that was my whole journey, all done. <laughs> um, so each petal is a day. <coughs> and I had other things taped up on the wall to colour in as I went through. So, uh, next uh, slide, please. Um, just after I finished my treatment and was beginning to recover, my son made a fairly shock announcement that he'd fallen in love with a girl from Sardinia <coughs> and was moving out there to live. And um, again, it's a reframe thing because, um, you know, one can go into that whole sense of loss of your child moving far away. But um, I decided to look on it as a great benefit because um, I just have to go and visit him a lot. <laughs> Sardinia is a very beautiful place. And this is a sunset from his balcony uh, that I visited many times. And I'll be going over there again in a couple of weeks. So here's a little reflection uh, that came out of my reflection. Looking back, I became aware that I had always been hard on my body and mind, pushing them despite their limitations, often in the face of tiredness or sickness. I had indeed battled with my own self. I had learned that acceptance of illness is not a state of giving up, but rather a state of grace, which is gentle on the body, mind and spirit and encourages healing at all levels. I have forgiven myself for the past and now spend time nurturing myself without feeling guilty. And I think often we get very caught up in caring for others, uh, but as they say on planes, you know, when the oxygen masks drop, you put your own one on first. <laughs> you need to value yourself and look after yourself because how else can you be of any help to anyone else. Okay. So um, coming to the end of uh, this particular part of life's journey, I was asked to give a talk in Oxford at the beautiful retreat centre that the Brahma Kumaris run there uh, to about 70 doctors and healthcare practitioners. Um, and I talked about these tools and how I'd use them. And a lot of people came up afterwards um, asking if I could write some notes and send the notes to them because they wanted to use them with their patients or themselves or a family member. So I went away and I started writing for the first time for a long time. And um, a kind of little book began to evolve and, and I was very aware that when I was ill it was very difficult to read and this book uh, was more of a picture book um, with um, a small amount of writing but what really got created from this were two CDs 
which were full of um, uplifting uh, tracks based on these tools that other people that could take into hospital when they were going through treatment, um, could uh, take into situations, could rest with, uh, because that didn't seem to be available. It just didn't, uh, the, that, that kind of self-help tool didn't seem to be around when I had my diagnosis. So I developed it as something that was very portable and audible and easy to lie and relax and listen to. So this was a seven tool, uh, lifting your spirit, seven tools for coping with illness. And it was uh, published in um, July 2008, I think, and it's been translated into such exotic languages as Icelandic and Portuguese. And uh, we've had some very wonderful feedback. It's been a gift to other people, and uh, it's very heartening to find that they find it so helpful. Um, I then got the writing bug, I suppose, and felt that um, also there were a lot of people who were ill, but actually might become ill if they didn't look after their well-being. So I decided to write The Heart of Wellbeing to help people not just survive but thrive, to support their well-being, to enhance their well-being. Um, and that is a similar kind of tool as the CDs. So, um, I'm aware my time is coming to a close. I'd like to finish uh, by reading you a poem that is my reflection of my journey through illness. And it was the first thing that I wrote um, after I had had all my treatment and was starting to recover. And I have to say my treatment was very successful. Um, and I was lying on a beautiful uh, beach. Could we just move on to that slide? Um, looking out to this wonderful sea that uh, I was about to swim in. And this just emerged on the page. And it's called Waving. I walked sure footed along the beach where the sand was packed down hard and the curve of its whiteness set out my path ahead. A rogue wave washed me into the sea and I struggled in the swell of an ocean without form or limits, my feet floating free of any surface below. I tried to swim towards the shore, but the currents took hold of my body and kept me apart from all I had known. Alone in a vastness of being, Floating in the bottomless blue, everything I thought I was, thought I did, began to sink away. Trying to plan my return to the knownness of land, my mind stayed full of a thousand thoughts without direction or intent, while I trod the waters of past suffering. As the tides closed over and around me, an enormous peace and stillness arose within. I was, after all, not alone, not separate, but a spark of light in a great teeming sea of life, not drowning, but waving. Thank you very much. We're very lucky, actually. We do have a surprise guest. Some of you may have seen uh, her coming in a minute ago. Uh, for those of you who don't know, her name is Stanley Chanky, and uh, she is the head of the whole of the Brahma Kumaris. Um, until the other day, we didn't know whether she was coming or not. She was meant to be coming. Or, few months ago and then her health wasn't very good and um, she is an amazing person because uh, she's age 96, she rushes around the world, no she shouldn't rush around the world, she travels around the world <laughs> and uh, wherever she goes uh, things, magic happens, she's full of a very special power, she has probably one of the most
most stable minds of anybody in the world because her brain waves have actually been you know, measured on those machines and things. And she's full of wisdom. She's devoted her whole life to really not only changing herself but uh, changing the world. And um, she's been recognized by the United Nations as one of the keepers of spiritual wisdom. And um, I won't really say any more because she will, you will see for yourself. But we're very fortunate to have her. She's an expert on dealing with ill health because she's been to hospital so many times. And in fact, at one stage, I think she spent a whole year at the retreat centre in Oxford not being able to do hardly anything. But she has used illness as a tool to transform herself. And not only itself, but everyone around her, whether it's the doctors or the nurses or the people who care for her at the retreat centre. So we're all very, very fortunate. So when the stage is ready, um, we'll invite Daddy to give us the benefit of her wisdom. <coughs> Listening through the ears, but really because you're listening to new things, there's a very beautiful feeling inside. What you hear outside throughout the whole day is something different, and what you hear in here is something different. Definitely, is that your experience? What you heard here all, all morning? What you heard here has been something that's helped you to know yourself, to go deep inside. I the mind, body, body, mind, Every time you speak of the mind and the body, it's the mind that comes first. You don't speak of the body. Thinking of body, mind, not mind, body. Mind and body. So, so to number one, to a accurate way. How we think, how we speak, all of that has to be very accurate. So, now I was going to be very happy about it. Another group that was taking meeting today, the wise women. That's also to our Saturday, special Saturday. So, it's a very special Saturday meeting, all of you today. मुझे खुशी होती है जब आप लोगों से मिलती हूँ आप भी खुश होते हैं ना I'm very happy to meet all of you and I'm sure you are all happy to meet you कौन है जो मेरे पास देख रहे हैं Who's meeting Daddy for the first time today? You raise your hands high. The first time Afterwards, you can share what you're actually seeing and feeling from Daddy. Those are meeting you for the first time. I don't think there's anyone else who's in the world who's able to keep their mind so still, so silent. Not suppressing it in any way. But keeping everything in order and control. If you try to suppress your mind, it's going to cause more mischief. The mind cannot bear to be suppressed in that way. Everyone else tries to suppress my mind, and if I'm doing the same thing to my mind, you can imagine what my condition will be. Being suppressed, being subservient, being, being dependent, so all of these things. The, all of these things are the habits that have developed in the mind which doesn't allow you to see who am I. It says, though I don't have the wisdom to see inside. Yeah, the mind. <coughs> so now today, let me become free from I and mine. <coughs> <coughs> 
These are two very important ego. When you speak of I, there's always the feeling of attachment. Feeling of ego, and when you speak of mind, then there's lots of attachments. Right? Is that right? Man, mira. <laughs> ego of I and attachment of mind. Everything you can no body brata. So both of these things have a big effect on the body. Hai to both gari gari or bimari mind me, par mukhya bimari hai ego attachment. There are very deep other illnesses of the mind also, but these are the two main ones: ego and attachment, that affect the body a great deal. Ego, jutha bhaman, juti. So artificial one. Ego is a false pride of everything artificial, everything of the materialistic world. Reality It doesn't allow me to stay in my reality of what is real. Attachment <coughs> Attachment, I'm just holding on to everything. <laughs> so the things, all the situations, they also hold on to me and I don't become free. I can't be free from that. So I have to maintain zeal and enthusiasm. When I'm not free, my zeal and enthusiasm finishes. Initially, and I'm free from ego, <coughs> and really a very beautiful <coughs> feeling. <coughs> so I'll clarify how I, one can become free from that ego and arrogance. Sukhya <coughs> man. It's very subtle, deep inside. Body conscious, where any say. Rather than body ke sat condition, any way. Being in connection with the body all day long, you're thinking in the same way, considering everything for the body all day long. It says that you have to do everything according to the world and you want to do everything just to show to the world what the world is demanding. Nowadays the world is such that fashion you never even thought of. You see all such kinds of fashions <laughs> everywhere in the world. <laughs> fashion of even glasses, <laughs> shoes and slippers, so many, so much fashion. <laughs> That yeah, I think has been almost to every airport in the world and when you go to the airports, so many wonderful things you see. When there's ego inside and you see someone else wearing a nice jacket, then you feel, I should have such a jacket. You see their hairstyle in a certain way, I should have the same hairstyle. When you see someone eating certain type of food, then there's greed that I should also eat the same. You know that food is not suitable for you, but still there's a desire that, no, I want to eat that same kind of food. I've seen that um, the illness of cancer, it's really starting from desires. When my desires are not fulfilled, then the illness um, develops. And then when you, when you hear of cancer, then in fact the person becomes even more ill because it's such an illness. And all my friends and relatives, they also get worried when they hear that I've got cancer. So what should I do to prevent such an illness? Or how can I help someone who's got cancer? Practically, I'm a practical 
मेरे को अनुभव है एक भाई था बड़ा जवान था तीस साल की उम्र थी वाइफ की अठावी साल उम्र थी पांच बच्चे थे That is sharing a story of a person 30 years old. His wife was 28 years old, and they had five children. They had a lot of wealth. And he, he was actually proud of his uh, position and money, and thinking, well, nothing's a big deal. I can look after my children. And suddenly, he had cancer. So what can one do then? He himself was experiencing a lot of sorrow then. So practically, his wife was in our company. If you are sad, then you will be sad. The wife, um, she actually was in contact with Daddy, and so Daddy told her that if you experience pain and sorrow from this, then he is going to feel worse from that. He'll feel a lot more <laughs> sorrow. But don't have any kind of worry about <coughs> this. <laughs> don't think about what's going to happen about my wife or children if I die. The wife used to. The wife learned how to meditate, and so that he was and created a beautiful atmosphere in the family. So she used to help him through meditation. And then she was thanking Daddy for helping to create such an atmosphere in the family. Before there was a lot of sorrow, a lot of worry in the family. Afterwards, she felt that I'm free from worry and um, sorrow. Also developed a lot of courage. Meditation. With meditation, was able, able to face the situation and look after the children very well also. Then. <laughs> So the, um, he had already lost another, the brother who had cancer, he had lost two brothers. So his mother was also worried, and the third one having cancer, so she was um, actually worried. Vibration. But then, having come through to learn meditation, she also felt uncomfortable not to create an atmosphere of sorrow in the family. Otherwise, the children also experience the same sorrow. Three things are essential in life. Anything can happen suddenly. You never know what's around the corner. So for such situations, I have to remain ever ready. <coughs> Worry, fear, and sorrow. People are always experiencing this, but I should remain free from these things. Do you think it's possible to keep myself free from worry, fear, and sorrow? I may not be ill, I'm perfectly well, health is good, but if I'm still, if I have these three habits of worry, fear and sorrow, I can't help anyone in any way. Throughout my whole life, I've experienced myself to be free from Worry, sorrow, and fear. It's because I've always had honesty, faith, and courage. These have helped me in my relationships with everyone. Truth, courage, and faith. This is something that Dukkha Chinta Bhaya Se Mukta Satya Himmat Me Bhaja Vishwas Rehm 
And those who understood that yes, it's necessary to be free from worry, sorrow, and fear, and to constantly have truth, courage, and faith in everything. You can see one is happening in life. So those who understood this, raise your hands. That you can face any situation in life when you've got truth, courage, and faith. If I'm constantly engaged in these um, powers of uh, worry, fear, and sorrow, then the feeling is I'm a useless soul and there's no purpose to my life. Even when I was 15, 17 years old, living in the world, yet I always used to ask myself, what is the purpose of my life? There used to be a devotional song that I used to hear and also sing that um, those who are experiencing sorrow, if you remove their sorrow and suffering, then God himself will help remove all your sorrow and suffering. So you don't need to engage yourself in any kind of sorrow and suffering, just liberate other souls. <laughs> But if I don't have the strength within myself to face the sorrow of others, how can I, of my own self, how can I help others? How can I liberate them? I should have so much truth, courage, and faith in my own self that anyone who comes in front of me, I'm able to empower them. I myself should remain free from any kind of tension. Never to experience any tension. Attention no. No tension, but total attention. Your feeling, good wishes to always to have good wishes and pure feelings. Pure feeling. Go deep inside and see what kind of feelings there are inside. No type of fear or sorrow in my feelings, but just faith and courage. Good wishes. Then with good wishes I'm able to help others. Because these are working from deep inside. Patient, patient, it looks like. And a patient doesn't even look like a patient. Yeah, but none of them. Both you put it. Good wishes really encourage them and empower them. They feel I'm okay. I said, "Koi doctor ho the, surgeon ho the. Oh, patient be mal dekhe, shikla si banave bichar patient na kya aur hoga." Just imagine if a doctor or surgeon was to go in front of the patient. And seeing the illness of the patient, their their face becomes small because they're seeing that it's such a severe condition. What's going to happen of the patient then? Because the patients are always watching the doctors and the surgeons who are treating them. So they're always looking at the doctors, seeing for signals. If the doctors were to have a small face seeing the condition of the patient, then the patient will feel disheartened. But in fact, the doctor should empower the patient, saying, nothing's wrong with you, you're going to be fine. In the mind, I said, the truth is that there is a lot of harm. Really, even within my own mind, I've seen how there's really so much, so many wonders through honesty, truth, and courage. जो इंजेक्शन दवाई कसर नहीं करता है वो हिम्मत विश्वास का मकरता है। What the medicines and injections are not able to do, the courage and faith is able to do and achieve. सच्चाई से ताकत है। Feel a lot of strength inside because of that truth. वो जो बिचारा अंदर थोड़ा अंदर निराश है निराश। तो निराशा ही खत्म हो जाती है, आशा पैदा हो जाती है। 
If someone's disheartened and feeling completely hopeless, then with this power of truth and courage, you're able to finish their disheartenment and give them hope. <coughs> You've seen how illnesses develop and sometimes get worse because of disheartenment, being disappointed and disheartened. So I mustn't allow myself to become hopeless in any situation. Not becoming hopeless myself and not allowing hope. others to Love. become hopeless. Happiness. But instead to feel hope, love, happiness. With these um, virtues, these qualities, hope, love, happiness, the feeling is as though nothing is like happening. Something new or that. Instead, there's a feeling that something new is happening. मुख्य बात है बीमारियों का कारण है कोई न कोई प्रकार का दुख और चिंता। Really, the main reason of the illnesses arising is worry and sorrow. उसे अब को फ्री करो। Ill feeling inside, so let me free myself from these things. तो खुद तो फ्री होंगे और उनको संयोग देंगे। So I'll I'll become free myself, but I'll also be able to help others then. The other thing is tiredness also. When there's tiredness inside, that also doesn't help, help you. Oh, I think the man, Buddha, I am not tired, but I am not tired. In today's world, old people as well as young people will say I'm tired. And imagine the condition of the car if it's constantly having the Tired, punctured. So in the same way, the human beings getting tired. Yeah, I'm driver only. My car. So I am the driver, the soul, the driver, and this body is my car, my vehicle. My Atman driver only. I'm the soul and the driver. Come to a driving license, my brother. Don't I say? So at least I should have the proper driving license to drive this vehicle. When you're driving, you have to make sure everything in the car is fine. The front lights, the rear lights, everything has to be in order. If someone wants to overtake me, let's let them do that. It's fine. I shouldn't get upset. Why is this one overtaking me? If they want to go ahead, fine, let them do that. Let me just give them way, I move to the other lane. Jealousy will be marked on the Jealousy is another reason for illness. Why is this one going ahead of me? Jealousy creates anger. These are the things that causes illness. If you understand this disease, तो बीमार भी ठीक हो जाता है सब समझाइए ये कारण से भी बीमार हुआ हो। If someone is ill, they realize the reasons for that illness, and you remove those reasons, and you can become well again. तो आराम से ड्राइवर समझो चल। So just consider yourself to be a very good driver and drive competently. कोई आगे जा बने जा। Let others go ahead of you. तो तुम ऐसे ऐसे करके तब चले जाना। Then you can make your own way also to go ahead again. Without coming in their way. मैं सारे विश्व भर में कई चांस मिला है जो ड्राइवर होता है ना मैं सब मिल के तो ड्राइव करना। Everywhere that he goes, she gets different drivers everywhere. So before she gets in the car, she tells them, "Be careful as you drive. Drive carefully." If you have an accident while I'm in the car, then the whole world's gonna be looking at you. <laughs> No need to rush if the red and the traffic signal is red light. Just wait. Red light, dekhra, but nahi car ko chalata. Sometimes the drivers rushing around so fast, they see the light is red, and still they go through the red lights, rushing through it. Red light, just give yourself time. Wait at the red light. When this light is green, then you can move ahead. So patience, peace, and love. 
in Holy Road Cargo. So take these three tablets every day. Patience, <laughs> peace, and love. Sukhukar. In the morning, just sadhana. Empower yourself with these three tablets. And the whole day will patience, be good. peace, love. Wow. <laughs> you don't need anything else. <laughs> Just patience, so, peace, and love. <laughs> Daddy doesn't like it when anyone asks her, Are you okay, Daddy? Are you well? She says, Can't you see? I'm okay. I'm fine. That is okay. But the guarantee is guarantee sometimes the body goes through something, and yes, there is pain of the body, but I don't feel any sorrow from that. The body is going through its own thing, but I the soul that the, body is free. the body is in pain, but the soul is free from sorrow. <laughs> then you're able to become free from that pain. We got a deal one and two It doesn't matter what the reason was of that pain, but it will go away. Sometimes you say there's a lot of pain, there's a lot of pain. But uh, you just have, to have, just have to have patience and you'll find it will go away. <coughs> Even to make a big thing into something very small, it's an act of someone who's got sense. What tends to happen is it's a very small situation and you make it into something very big. So there's no cure for that. One more thing I'd like to share. Don't give sorrow to anyone and don't take sorrow from anyone. No matter who is causing sorrow for you, don't take, accept that. Doesn't matter what it is, sometimes I find people are just <laughs> testing me, but I shouldn't allow myself to experience sorrow. Really, this is the best cure, not to cause sorrow to anyone and not to accept sorrow from anyone. Really, the cause of this illness is by taking sorrow and giving sorrow. What should I do if I want to remain ever healthy, wealthy, and happy? Healthy, wealthy, happy. Healthy, koi dhan nahi. But under the Bhagwan, something that they tell me, purity, peace, love, happiness. Not the physical wealth, but the wealth of um, the qualities that God is giving me: purity, peace, love, happiness. The wealth of all of these things. Purity, peace, love, happiness. To be healthy, Our wealthy, happy, to have these things inside. Healthy, yeah, Healthy, yeah, no. Happy, yeah, no. Experiencing the power in the self. Don't worry, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. The mantra for you to take away. Anyone has any questions? Don't worry, no problems. <laughs> A special gift for all of you. Don't worry, no problems. But it, there may be pain in my feet, but why should it show on my face? <laughs> or my, my waist, my stomach, I might be feeling some pain there. My back may be hurting, but why should it show on my face? If my face remains fine, if my face remains well, then everything else will be fine. This has been my experience. It's an old body and yes, many tests will come. If I don't give tests, how can I pass through them? Constantly remain smiling and you'll find nothing is difficult. Just rehearse this and see if you're smiling, you'll find nothing is difficult. 
The situations are external and feeling the power of the smile inside. When I'm smiling, I feel But if I say it's difficult, then really it becomes a very big situation. It feels like it's something very big. Let go. Instead, let me just let go of everything. Let go of everything and move forward because the situation is now over. Bhagwan mera sati hai, mein sakhi ho kar ke play karne mein hero part padari hoon. God is my companion and in playing my part, my role, I'm a hero actor. Almighty authority mera baap hai. Almighty authority is my father, God is my father. Sikhya kya hai, sat guru hai. He's my teacher, he's my son. Don't worry. Don't worry. So he's telling me, don't worry. Okay. 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 Okay.